so glad that you could uh, be with us tonight for um, our book review. Tonight's book review is about a much maligned bird that is essential for the ecology of our planet. A bird so important that it is protected by the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. Many myths and misinformation are um, spread about this bird, the sun love bird, and author Katie Fallon is with us tonight to discuss her well-written, informative book, Vulture, The Private Life of an Unloved Bird. So, um, let's uh, turn this over and I will like welcome Katie. We're going to switch to her presenter screen and it'll take just a few minutes, so bear with us. And then, um, Katie, welcome. And I want to get right to it, the heart of your book. Why did you write this book? And how did you gather the research that you've used, the material, uh, for the book? Because it is an, an interesting read that is also um, very important and authentic in nature. Well, thank you. Um, thank you for the question, and thank you very much for having me. Um, I'm very excited to talk about uh, vultures um, um, and my book. Let me see if I'm going to move. Hold on a second. Okay. Um, this, the, the question was about the research I did. And uh, it took me, this book actually took something like 15 years maybe for me to um, write from the time I started it until the time I finished it. Um, it started out with with just me watching watching vultures and volunteering at a small um, wildlife rehab center and I thought that the vultures were fascinating and they were just very different from the other birds that we would get in for rehab uh, so I started writing about them um, and and then then I also got interested in cerulean warblers <laughs> And uh, the cerulean warbler is the fastest declining songbird in North America. So I sort of got sidetracked from my vulture project, and I wrote a book about cerulean warblers, um, and then I returned to the, to the vulture project. But I tried to read everything I could about turkey vultures and vultures in general, and I tried to talk to people who um, did research on the birds and just learn everything I could about them. Uh, and it's they're really fascinating, not just as a species, but as a whole group of birds. Vultures are often, um, as you said, they're often, you know, uh, people don't love them as much as they should, I think. <laughs> so part of my, my mission in writing the book was just to uh, gain, let people gain some appreciation for vultures. And I think if people knew vultures, they would love them. <laughs> So um, would you like me just to go ahead with my, all right. So I've got this um, slide presentation and uh, this, this should be um, some stuff about my, some information about my book and then a lot of information about vultures and um, hopefully uh, you'll have some questions afterwards. But first, uh, Vulture, the Private Life of an Unloved Bird uh, is the title we went with for this book. Um, some. Uh, alternative titles were uh, Vulture, Eat Your Heart Out, and uh, <laughs> Vulture, um, Happy Entrails to You. Um, but uh, we didn't, we didn't, we didn't go with those. <laughs> but the bird is not always unloved. Um, there are still there are people besides just me who love the birds. Um, this picture is taken at Boyce Thompson Arboretum State Park, which is about an hour from uh, Phoenix, Arizona, and they have two vulture festivals every year um, at this state park. They have the Bye Bye Buzzards Festival and they have the Welcome Back Buzzards Festival. <laughs> um, one is in March and one is in September and I've been to both of them and they're, they're a lot of fun. 
Uh, and there are some other places around the country that have vulture festivals as well. So they do have some fans, um, not just, you know, crazy <laughs> Katie Fallon. Um, but then uh, this, this book, uh, which you saw the cover of a couple, uh, couple minutes ago, this is the new version of the book. There's um, an old version. It's not that old. It came out about uh, less than three years ago, or about three years ago, I guess. Um, but this new edition just came out in September. So it's it's the text is mostly the same, but it's got this nice new color cover and it's got a color expanded color photo section in the middle. But um, now let's let's talk about uh, vultures in general for a minute. So ooh, no, I'm gonna move this over here. So the big picture on vultures. Uh, worldwide, um, there are 23 species, 16 in Africa, Asia, and Europe, and seven in North and South America. And they're not very closely related to each other. The New World and the Old World um, vultures do a lot of the same things for ecosystems, but they're not very closely related, um, which I think is pretty interesting. They're also not doing well as a group. Um, 11 of the 16 African and Eurasian vultures are endangered and eight are considered critically endangered. And then here in the New World, uh, the California condor is critically endangered. Um, you may have heard about the fires recently that were um, out in the western U.S. and the Big Sur um, condor sanctuary actually burned down their research facilities. Uh, and they lost, um, I, I think they haven't accounted for maybe nine California condors uh, that were uh, living in that condor sanctuary. So uh, I think that the biologists suspect the worst, but um, which is really unfortunate for this critically endangered species. Uh, so the threats to the vultures worldwide are similar. Um, the threats include poisoning. Where you are in the world um, kind of depends on what kind of poisoning is a problem. In uh, Asia, it was sort of um, kind of a famous famous case. Um, four vulture species in India are now critically endangered from eating cattle that had been treated with an NSAID called diclofenac before the cattle died. And diclofenac was used to treat a wide variety of ailments, just like you might take Advil for a headache, a, a backache, a fever, um, a lot of different things. But unfortunately, the vultures would eat cattle that had been treated with this NSAID, and then the vultures would die. And it took several years for um, veterinarians and uh, scientists to figure out why the vultures were, um, were dying. Now diclofenac has been um, banned in um, India, Pakistan, and Nepal, I believe. Uh, but the birds are still going to take a long time for their population uh, to recover. Um, in Africa, uh, poachers will sometimes poison uh, elephant carcasses or rhino carcasses. Uh, so when the vultures land and eat the carcasses, uh, the vultures will die instead of soaring up in the sky and creating sort of a big flock over a carcass that might alert authorities. Um, and then here in the U.S., uh, lead poisoning has been identified as the biggest hurdle that California condors face. Uh, the biggest thing that they have to get over before they can recover is this um, lead poisoning. And I'll talk more about that in a few minutes, about lead poisoning and, and um, scavenging birds. Uh, electrocution is a problem for a lot of large bird species, not just vultures, but um, eagles and other species hitting power lines. And there are some um, belief-based threats. People believe a lot of things about vultures that aren't true and that end up in the vultures being um, killed or persecuted. Uh, that's everything from, um, there's a bird called the bearded vulture that the, the traditional belief is that they kill lambs, um, but they, it's been discovered that they don't really kill lambs. Um, they, eat, they eat primarily bones. Uh, and that vulture's name, it used to be the lammergeier, and that's still the, the species name that's accepted, but some folks are trying to change and call them the bearded vulture because they're not, not really lamb vultures. Um, other belief-based 
threats. Uh, in Southern Africa, there's a black market trade in vulture body parts, especially their heads and their brains. There's this sort of uh, traditional belief that if you smoke the brains or, or have the heads of vultures, it will give you sort of a, a second sight, sort of a clairvoyant. So uh, like, like the vultures seem to appear in the sky above a carcass as if they had some sort of um, you know, special ability to know where a carcass is. So uh, that, it's been shown that this belief-based persecution in Southern Africa um, for vulture body parts actually has had an effect on these critically endangered species. I have never tried to smoke vulture brains. I don't know if it works, but it probably does. Probably doesn't. <laughs> um, speaking of some African vulture species, um, these this, these photos here are photos. They're not. I didn't take these photos, uh, but this is an amazing um, lappet-faced vulture, uh, very very large vulture, and this this vulture is one of the first one of the birds that can really open up a big carcass. If you look at that really big, strong, sharp beak, um, these can come in and get through, you know, tear through thick hide, where in North America our turkey vultures and black vultures have a more difficult time um, kind of getting into a carcass. In the Pleistocene, you know, during the last ice age, there were more vultures in North America, and there would have been a lot more large vulture species, larger than the California condor even. That would have been, you know, the, the big species to open up a carcass, where the smaller species could then come in and feed. Um, but, you know, here in North America, our, a lot of our Pleistocene megafauna, like the mammoths and the um, uh, other, you know, mastodons are all extinct, so... Uh, the big scavengers went with them. This is another um, old world vulture species that I feel I find just beautiful. This is the griffin vulture. Um, the griffin vulture uh, is, has a, a fairly big range. Um, this is the species that often helps out with the um, Tibetan sky burials, if you've ever heard of that. Um, we can talk about that later maybe, <laughs> or you can look it up on YouTube if you want to. Um, see videos of it. It's a little bit gruesome. And then this is the bird I just mentioned um, a few minutes ago. This is the bearded vulture. And you can see this this bird has bones and its beak right here. The vast majority, is, I think it's 80% of this bird's diet is bones and bone marrow. So this is one of the last birds to come and eat at a carcass. Uh, bearded vultures in um, Africa and some parts of Europe uh, it's a really large bird that's um, just amazing. Nothing really looks quite like a bearded vulture. Uh, they will sometimes take bones and fly up high with them in their beaks and then drop them so the bones break open and they can get at that delicious bone marrow. Just a really, um, a really amazing bird. And then coming over here to the New World, uh, no less amazing, um, this is the king vulture. And if you've been uh, gone birding ever in um, Central America or South America, you might have seen this beautiful, really large vulture, this very colorful, um, amazing, uh, amazing face skin. And then here's our California condor. Another just striking looking bird with those red eyes and those really spiky feathers um, all around their all around their faces. Uh, the California condor is um, you probably know the largest flying land bird in North America with about a 10 foot wingspan. Um, it's a very large bird, very very beautiful in my opinion. <laughs> okay, so coming back to some some words here. Uh, vultures are primarily scavengers all over the world, even though new and old world vultures aren't closely related. Again, they fill the same ecological niche, um, which is scavenging. Uh, vultures in general have strong stomach acid and gut flora that allow them to eat dangerous pathogens like rabies, anthrax, um, botulism toxin, polio, cholera, um, etc. So these birds can actually eat an animal that has died of something like anthrax, and their strong guts basically fry anything that goes through them. So uh, in their droppings, there's no trace of the disease anymore. 
which is very important for a healthy ecosystem. If you imagine um, how a, a disease, some of these diseases could spread very rapidly without something out there to neutralize them. So they're really the ecosystem heroes <laughs> in a lot of ways. Um, they quickly and efficiently remove carcasses, which is something that mammalian scavengers are not quite as good at. Uh, they also, vultures reduce the number of, and concentration of mammalian scavengers, which is very important for something like rabies, which of course is um, you know, zoonotic, zoonotic disease that um, you don't want to get if you're a human. Um, mammalian scavengers feeding in the same, uh, the same carcass could share saliva, uh, or even if you had you know, um, outdoor cats or raccoons or something feeding out of the same dish, swapping saliva, um, that's a way to spread rabies. So vultures um, reduce the concentration of mammalian scavengers at carcasses because they so quickly and efficiently um, remove them from the landscape. So they deserve a lot more credit for this, these ecosystem services than they get. So now to our, our friend the turkey vulture here. So they're the world's most widespread and probably or maybe um, most abundant vulture species. Most folks agree that the turkey vulture is the most widespread, so they have the biggest range of any vulture. But the uh, American black vulture may be more abundant, more numerous than turkey vultures, but they're, they're probably about the same in reality. Turkey vultures, that big range, um, they're from southern central Canada all the way to the tip of Argentina and nearly everywhere in between. Um, Caribbean islands, Falkland islands, they're on coastlines, deserts, mountains, um, they have very, uh, very variable habitats. Um, they're, they're all over the place and they're fairly successful wherever they are. They're not in cities and as close to, close to human um, habitation as the black vulture. The black vulture is sort of a more cosmopolitan vulture in a lot of ways, but the turkey vulture is um, lots of different kind of habitats, very big range. Globally, there could be up to 20 million turkey vultures, which is a lot of vultures. My other favorite bird, the cerulean warbler, there may only be 300,000 of them. So comparing that to 20 million turkey vultures, and then another probably 20 million black vultures. Um, so there are a lot of both species. There are usually six subspecies. Um, some folks say there are only five subspecies, but there are Usually, most people agree there are six subspecies of turkey vulture, three that breed in North America, and then three that breed in the tropics. And these different populations have different migratory strategies, uh, which is really fascinating. Each subspecies does something a little bit different, um, and I'll talk about that in a couple minutes, too. This is the uh, current Cornell uh, Lab of Ornithology map of turkey vulture range. I'm not sure what the big white spots are in the middle of the U.S. I'm thinking maybe there aren't very many e-birders there or <laughs> something like that. There probably are turkey vultures. And here we have the whole hemisphere. Uh, the purple is where they are, of course, all year. Although turkey vultures are showing up further and further north in the winter than they have been historically. So. Where I am uh, in north central West Virginia, it shows that we don't have turkey vultures um, in the winter, but uh, we do. Most winters, we do have turkey vultures here. A lot fewer than in the summer, but still, still some turkey vultures. Uh, but the majority of the world's turkey vultures are in the tropics. Um, probably about 70% of the turkey vultures uh, live in the tropics, and about 90% of the black vultures are in the tropics too, in Central and South America. If you're out bird watching, um, this is probably the view you're going to get of the turkey vulture from underneath. And one of my favorite quotes from Edward Abbey from the book Desert Solitaire, let us praise the noble turkey vulture. No one envies him. He harms nobody. And he contemplates our little world from a most serene and noble height. <laughs> uh, but when you're out there bird watching and you're, and you're looking up at this big bird, you'll see the um, undersides of the wings and tail are light, and that tail is relatively long and thin. And this is different from what uh, a bald eagle or a golden eagle or a black vulture looks like from beneath. You can remember that turkey vultures have silver linings. 
So it's it's the the silver again is all the way underneath um, the bird. California condors also have some some white underneath their wings, but it sort of looks like they're wearing deodorant. Uh, if you ever see a California condor from underneath, I mean, just think about it wearing deodorant, and you'll see what I mean. <laughs> Uh, up close, um, the turkey vulture is a very handsome character. Um, they uh, weigh about four pounds um, here in the uh, most most parts of the U.S. About four pounds. The turkey vultures in the Southwest are a little bit smaller, and the turkey vultures in the Upper West are a little bit larger. In the Eastern U.S., about four pounds is is um, usually what they weigh. They've got this uh, five to six foot wingspan, which is very similar to a bald eagle. But if you, um, a bald eagle will weigh 10 or 12 pounds. So it's a much heavier, stronger bird. A turkey vulture is really built for soaring and conserving energy. So they've got these big wings that they almost don't have to flap once they catch um, an updraft or thermal. Brown black feathers, of course, but they look you know, almost iridescent when the light hits them right. And they've got chicken-like feet. Um, if you look at this bird, this is this is a turkey vulture named Blue, who lives at the Avian Conservation Center of Appalachia, a um, nonprofit that I work with. Um, if you check out Lou's feet, they're flat. They're not curved, and uh, they're not you know strong talons like a hawk or an eagle um, or an owl. They're they're these big flat chicken feet. They're not made for grabbing and carrying anything away. Um, a turkey vulture can't really carry anything in its feet. Um, it can grab something with its beak and drag it along the ground, uh, but they're not, they, they can't swoop down, pick up a squirrel, and fly away with it. Um, they're just not designed to do that. They're designed to feed on the ground, um, standing on a carcass, and tearing chunks off with this beautiful, curved, sharp, sharp beak. So if you look at that, that's a that beak could hurt you if it bit you, <laughs> but it's um it's not as strong as uh, some of the larger that lappet faced vulture I showed you at the beginning. That beak would be a lot stronger. A turkey vulture's beak is very good for tearing chunks off and swallowing them. Uh, if you can look at this bird's tongue, if you look closely at its tongue, especially kind of towards the back of the tongue, you might notice serrations like a saw blade, and that helps the turkey vulture swallow slippery chunks of food. So like, you know, entrails that are bloody or wet or kind of gross, so if you're not eating dinner. Um, but that, that serrated tongue will help kind of move those slippery chunks of food to the back of the bird's throat. The uh, turkey vultures also have an excellent sense of smell. You can see those nostrils on top of the nose. Uh, you can see right through one into out the other side, and turkey vultures do use their excellent sense of smell as well as their excellent eyesight to locate their prey. Uh, well, prey instead, their food. <laughs> um, some other scavenging birds will follow turkey vultures to food because uh, turkey vultures can often find it first. Black vultures will sometimes displace turkey vultures at a carcass. Uh, bald eagles, red-tailed hawks, golden eagles, even ravens will sometimes chase turkey vultures away from a carcass, even if turkey vultures have found it first. There are two other species of vulture with excellent, uh, an excellent sense of smell, the lesser yellow-headed vulture and the greater yellow-headed vulture. Um, they both live in the tropics. They're very closely related to turkey vultures. They look almost identical except they have a yellow face, yellowish face. This face skin is different color. So turkey vultures are considered obligate scavengers, so they're, they eat carrion, dead things. Um, they're not equipped for killing or taking live prey. There have been um, in, you know, some cases where they have taken live prey, but they've been on very unusual circumstances. Um, for example, uh, where maybe small fish wash up on a beach and become stranded, a turkey vulture was documented walking over to them and swallowing them before they were dead. Um, 
and small nestling birds that maybe have fallen out of the nest that, that are too small to move on their own. A turkey vulture might walk over and swallow them. But it's, it's uh, not equipped to kill something. It can swallow bite-sized items, but uh, the cases of them taking any live prey are very few and far between. However, um, they, they do learn uh, where there are reliable sources of carrion. So while they're not necessarily encouraging, you know, the rabbits to get run over by cars, um, they might learn where uh, roadkill happens frequently. Um, and they also may, um, you know, if, if there are carcasses disposed um, at a farm in the same place or if the Department of Highways puts carcasses somewhere, um, the turkey vultures will learn where that is and congregate in that area. And once you say you like vultures, a lot of people will send you their vulture comics, and there are lots of good ones. This is one of my favorite ones from um, Bird and Moon. Uh, I'm a turkey vulture, yes indeed. My head is bare to prevent rotting flesh from adhering to it. And you notice with other vultures, pictures we saw at the beginning, many vulture species have bare heads or mostly bare heads to prevent the, their meals from getting, getting stuck to their feathers. How gross would that be, right? Um, to keep cool, I poop on my legs and feet. Uh, this is, there's actually a term for this. It's called urohydrosis. We usually call it an accident in my house um, when somebody goes to the bathroom on their legs or feet. But it helps regulate uh, the bird's body temperature. And it's not just turkey vultures that do this. Um, other species of vulture do it too. Um, storks will do this and a few others as well. It's, it's, um, uh, it's the liquid waste. They expel the liquid waste onto their legs. Um, my main defense is projectile vomiting, uh, which is true. Turkey vultures uh, aren't at risk for a lot of predators. However, they are vulnerable in the nest and they are also vulnerable when they're on the ground feeding. Uh, turkey vultures in a nest could be predated by um, raccoons or coyotes, maybe dogs. Of course, people might bother a vulture in a nest. Um, projectile vomiting would, vomiting would, of course, scare away or chase away most humans who are coming up to the nest. It also might provide an easy meal for something like a raccoon or a coyote that might end up eating the vomit instead of eating the baby vulture. Uh, I have a beagle here, and I think that my beagle would would definitely eat uh, turkey vulture vomit if given the chance <laughs> and then roll around in it. Uh, but the vomiting also can be a way to lighten the load if the birds have to fly away quickly. Uh, sometimes they'll throw up, and then as they're flying away, if they have to try to get off the ground in a hurry. So speaking of vomit, um, baby turkey vultures, uh, turkey vultures in a nest are uh, often um, vomit whenever anybody comes nearby. And they, they nest, turkey, I should mention, they nest in caves, cliffs, abandoned structures, sometimes right on the ground in a, under a brush pile or uh, in a very big hollow tree or a car in a junkyard, but caves, cliffs, um, haylofts, tr deer tree stands, those are probably the most common places that turkey vultures will nest. Um, this one is in a cave. This is in um, southwest Pennsylvania. And these baby turkey vultures are, are in a uh, hayloft. And you might notice on the lower right hand side of your screen, uh, there are some piles of um, Oh, turn it. There are some piles of uh, reddish brown goo, and that's baby turkey vulture vomit. And uh, baby turkey vulture vomit is worse than adult turkey vulture vomit because it's sort of twice partially digested roadkill. Uh, if you remember, we talked about how the turkey vultures can't carry anything in their feet, so they're bringing food back to the nest that they've already eaten and then they regurgitate for their babies, and then the babies eat it. And then something bothers the baby turkey vultures in the nest, and they throw up. So it's, if that gets in your car, it's a very hard smell <laughs> to get out. Uh, baby turkey vultures can, can look a lot like 
uh, baby black vultures, um, you'll notice that these birds don't have the red heads yet. Um, they have a gray, gray head. And black vultures, of course, have uh, gray heads. Um, baby turkey vultures, however, have white down feathers. And baby black vultures have uh, brownish tan down feathers. So if you, if you hear something sort of hissing up in the hayloft of your barn, and you look and there are baby vultures in there, if they're fuzzy white birds, they're turkey vultures. If they're fuzzy tan birds, they're black vultures. Uh, but this, this face. The skin changes to red over the course of about a year. Uh, so you can usually tell if you're looking at a young turkey vulture. And the end of the beak fades to white over about, about the same amount of time, about a year. So you can um, often tell if you've got a young turkey vulture um, by the color of its face. So what are we doing with these baby turkey vultures? Why am I in these nests? Well, uh, my small um, nonprofit. Um, ACCA uh, partners with several other groups, um, Hawk Mountain in Pennsylvania, um, USGS, uh, WVU, and some other folks. And we have, you have to have a permit to bother birds in a nest. They're federally protected species. Uh, so we, we travel to known turkey vulture nests, and we take the babies out of the nests for about, it's only about 15 minutes from start to finish. Um, we take some measurements. Um, we take a blood sample, and we um, will put a wing tag on the bird. But to talk about the um, blood sample for a second, you can you, I don't, if this, uh, this is a bird on a baby scale, and then right behind him is a lead care kit. So we can take a blood sample um, from a turkey vulture and test it for lead right on the spot to see how much lead is in the bird's blood. And we take the blood uh, from a vein, usually a vein in the wing, um, just a, a tiny vial to put uh, to, to measure the lead. So turkey vultures can handle quite a bit of lead. They can eat a lot of lead and not get sick. Uh, California condor, however, um, gets sick from eating, can get very sick and die from eating lead. And a bald eagle or golden eagle, red-tailed hawk, um, crows, ravens, uh, they can handle even less lead than a California condor or a turkey vulture. Uh, a bald eagle only needs to eat a piece of lead about the size of a grain of rice to become very, very sick. So uh, how are they getting lead? This is where uh, this always gets controversial. Um, one way they get lead is eating spent ammunition. So if a hunter kills a white-tailed deer, for example, and then field dresses the deer and leaves the gut pile in the, in the field, the scavenger comes along and eats the gut pile. And that's a great source of food. If you think about a natural system where the big predator comes through, uh, makes a kill, and then the scavenger comes along behind and cleans up the mess. That's what's supposed to happen. However, if there are pieces of lead in the gut pile, uh, and the bird can inadvertently swallow them and become sick. Uh, turkey vultures, since they can handle quite a bit of lead, you can test their blood for lead levels and get a sense of how much lead is out there in the ecosystem. And the source is not just from spent ammunition. Um, you can also, the birds can also get lead from breathing coal-fired power plant emissions uh, or emissions from smelting plants. Um, I'm going to put this on the very bottom of the screen. There's a title of a paper if you want to see, read more about this. Uh, it's called Chronic Lead Exposures, Epidemic, and Obligate Scavenger Populations in Eastern North America. And this was um, a paper that my husband, Jesse, who's in that picture, was one of the authors. Um, we were able to obtain about 100 dead black and turkey vultures. And we tested levels of lead in not just the blood, but in the bones of the birds. Lead circulates, the blood circulates, you know, the lead uh, moves through the blood fairly quickly, but it deposits, stays in the bones for longer. So they looked at uh, several bones throughout the bird's body to test for lead levels. And they determined that 100% uh, of the birds in the study had elevated lead, um, ev evidence of chronic lead exposure. Uh, so that was 
sort of surprising that 100% of something in a study had uh, what they were testing for. Uh, we also, oh, oh, I forgot I had this picture here. This is my children helping. <laughs> uh, there are our field assistants um, with the baby turkey vultures. And um, we make my, put my daughter, this is my daughter, Laurel. Um, we put her to work keeping track of the measurements. So maybe she's a young, um, you know, budding ornithologist, <laughs> field, field ornithologist. Um, and they're in all of her pink. <laughs> So what all, we also uh, put wing tags on the on the baby birds, and the wing tags are floppy, um, light lightweight material similar to a cattle ear tag. So um, why can't you put a metal leg band on a turkey vulture safely? Uh, well, it's because they expel liquid waste onto their legs and feet, and the metal leg bands can get covered and caked in that, and they can corrode the metal, and it can also uh, cause the bird um, to damage to its leg. They used to put metal leg bands on turkey vultures, um, but they've stopped uh, for at least the last at least 20 or 30 years. So this will also allow people on the ground bird watching to look up and see um, you know, see who you're looking at without having to recapture it. So this particular bird was tagged um, in 2016 in Avella, Pennsylvania, which is right on the right on the West Virginia, Pennsylvania border, it's very close to Ohio also in the kind of the that northern skinny northern panhandle of West Virginia. Uh, usually when we've had reports of our tagged birds, they're from very close to the nest location, maybe right after the birds fledged. But this fella or or lady went all the way to West Palm Beach, Florida. So and he was sighted at a wildlife management area um, on April 13th, 2017. So this bird, you know, less than a year old, this bird went all the way to Florida. Uh, and the bird watcher reported the wing tag to the Federal Bird Banding Laboratory, and then they got in touch with us, and then we were able to get in touch with the bird watcher who saw saw the bird. And the bird watcher said, you know, there wasn't anything remarkable about, about it. There were just turkey vultures eating at a kind of a dried up swamp. Um, the only remarkable thing was that one had a wing tag. So it was uh, really cool that we got to figure out, you know, see where our baby turkey vulture ended up. So the eastern eastern subspecies of turkey vulture, this is about as far as they will migrate. The eastern subspecies uh, is known as um, they're partial migrants. So these birds don't migrate very quickly. They migrate about a quarter of the speed as the western birds do, and we'll talk about them in a second. Um, and they might not go all the way to Florida every every winter. Like we have turkey vultures most of the year in West Virginia. Some turkey vultures from maybe New York um, or, or further in New England might only go as far as Virginia, or they might go to the Jersey Shore for the winter. But Miami is about as far as any eastern turkey vulture will go. Uh, this is a turkey vulture wearing a transmitter. Um, this is a bird that we rehabilitated at the ACCA, and we released with the transmitter. So this was a turkey vulture who was shot. She still has three shotgun pellets in her body uh, that the veterinarian determined it would be cause more damage to get them out than it would to just leave them. So uh, we, had, we had this transmitter donated to us. It's about $4,000 cost, um, but we were very fortunate somebody donated uh, for us to put it on this bird. As to my knowledge, this is the only West Virginia turkey vulture wearing a transmitter um, ever. So it's a very small sample size of one. But here is where she went. So this, this map over on the left, the star is where she was released. This is two maps next to each other, but the skinny map on the left. The star is where we released her near Morgantown. And she went to northern Georgia when she migrated. And then she came back, not, she didn't go back exactly to Morgantown. She went back to the area where she was originally from. She was from Tucker County, West Virginia. So she went back there. And then the next year, she went back to northern Georgia again. And then she went back again to Tucker County, West Virginia. Um, and we haven't had, we haven't had any uh, data from her since the end of 2016. 
That doesn't necessarily mean that she's dead, however. Um, I don't fully understand the technology, but the transmitter that she's wearing uses cell phone towers. Um, and the end, late 2016 is when AT&T shut down their 2G cell phone towers. So this apparently could have had some effect on her. Uh, her like she has an old cell phone. <laughs> Doesn't work as well. Uh, and we don't have any way of locating her now to capture her to fix it. So, but it's still really cool to see that this bird that was shot and you know left for dead, we were able to rehab it, rehab her, and get her several more years of cleaning up roadkill, um, and, you know, living her life. So, pretty cool. Um, this bird, this is the sub, this is the uh, second subspecies of turkey vulture that lives in North America. This is the uh, Meridian Alice subspecies that breeds in the upper upper west and upper Midwest. This is a bird from Saskatchewan named Leo, and this is a bird that Hawk Mountain put a transmitter on in 2007. And as far as I know, she's still transmitting. The transmitter I think is still working. At least of a year or two ago, it was still working. Uh, she goes. She follows almost the same exact route south and then back north um, every year. So these birds are considered complete migrants. They all leave the upper upper west and go all the way to um, Central and South America. Leo um, nests, raises babies in, an, in the attic of an abandoned farmhouse in Saskatchewan and spends the winter in a grove of palm trees on the Venezuela-Colombia border. Uh, and interestingly, her mate wears a transmitter also so the, the pair has been together since 2007. Um, so uh, turkey vultures are considered to mate for life or, or be strong pair bonders. But the male goes somewhere different in the winter. <laughs> he goes further into Colombia in the winter. So they don't spend the winters together, but they return to the same place um, to have their nest, uh, which I think is really pretty fascinating. Maybe the separate winter vacations is why they've been together you know, all these years. <laughs> Yeah, and then the other, um, this is the third subspecies. This is also considered partial, partial migrants. They are, um, they are uh, similar to the eastern turkey vultures, um, the, the southwestern subspecies that, that uh, breeds in Arizona, southern California. They will just go further into Mexico and cent or Central America and then back. Uh, Katie, I have a question for you. Sure. That Second um, map that you showed of the of the couple of the the vultures that are in Saskatchewan and then they go to Colombia and Venezuela, is that the one in your book? Is, yes. Is that okay? In <laughs> Katie's book, uh, before each chapter, she writes a little essay from the the female vulture's uh, perspective of what's happening in her flight when she migrates and then when she goes back to Saskatchewan and has her babies. And it's very, very interesting. And it, it really gives a, um, oh, what do I want to say, a very personal look at the bird. And much more so than, you know, the bird flies here and they don't winter together and all that. But it, it just really makes the bird alive and I really like that about your book and it, it's throughout the whole story of them and then each chapter deals with something and um, this is really fascinating Katie and I just wondered how much more you had to go because I want people to have some time for questions if they have any and I wanted to be able to promote the other things that you're going to do with Western Cuyahoga Audubon Society but um, I don't want to cut you short. No, no, this is actually a very good place to stop. Oh, well, good. <laughs> All right. Well, um, we have two two people who have joined us tonight. Uh, Lily, um, I wondered if you would unmute yourself and maybe ask a question if you would like to, um, if you have any, or just say that you don't have any, and then we'll uh, ask Michelle if she has any uh, on any um, <clears throat> questions. So, um, Lily, um, did you have one? 
Hi there. Um, I don't have any questions, but I just wanted to say that this has been a, a very fascinating um, event. I have really enjoyed it so far. Yeah, so thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, Katie has made it very enjoyable, hasn't she? It's really been great. Well, you be sure to tell everybody <laughs> so that they okay. can. Um, we are recording it. So they will uh, be able to watch it and share. You know, they'll be able to see what you saw live. So, okay, Michelle, uh, to you, do you have any questions for uh, Katie? I, I do have a question, uh, but first I had a comment, and that is, you know, I've always liked vultures, but I feel after reading your book, Katie, that I have a whole new appreciation. Um, and I, I also enjoyed, I mean, obviously there's some bad news about vultures and how they're treated, and uh, but it was also really nice to hear about all the ways that vultures are celebrated throughout the world. You, you gave a couple of examples, um, and one of those examples I think was the Vulture Festival in, in Hinkley, which is really close to me, so I'm going to go check that out the next time they have that. So thank you, I never knew. Um, it's really fun. Yeah. Okay, awesome. I'm going to check it out when they have it next. Uh, so my question, um, you had mentioned, I wrote it down, uh, you, you had mentioned um, that the range maps for some of these vultures are not accurate or, you know, that one of the vultures, I think you're talking about the turkey vulture, you do see in your area year round, yet the range map doesn't quite go that high for their winter stay. Um, and I'm sure that you eBird when you see them. So what do you think will it take for these organizations who maintain the range maps to adjust them? Oh, I think that, I think that they are trying to. Um, I know that, uh, that in the Birds of the World, um, if you subs I don't know if you subscribe to the Bird Birds of the World, which is that really cool online, you know, species account, um, species accounts for uh, for all I guess all the birds of the world now, and they they kind of keep adding to it and expanding it. Okay. And I know that some of the species they do use like the very up to date eBird data for their maps. And I think that it just doesn't quite keep up. Like the the okay. maps just don't quite keep up with how fast the birds are expanding um, north. Um, it's interesting. Uh, usually, it's sad when you talk about um, climate change and mm -hmm. uh, birds in decline. Um, but turkey vultures and black vultures are two species that are probably kind of benefiting from the world getting warmer. Uh, they're able to stay further north in the winters. Um, we also have, you know, these roads that that stay warm um, and that provide meals for vultures. Uh, and they also provide lift for the birds because the hot air rising off the roads um, helps the birds helps the birds fly. So uh, I used to drive Interstate 81 a lot through the Shenandoah Valley in Virginia, and it was just like vulture. <laughs> Vulture mainline, um, and uh, I I think that that I think the maps will catch up, um, but it's just everything you know moves moves. It seems like it moves more slowly, at least in the vultures in this in this case. Sometimes uh, I gave I gave a, a presentation in New York whenever we were allowed to go places. I, I think it was in December, and uh, last December. Um, and before the presentation, I went to eBird and looked up where they'd seen black vultures, um, you know, right around New York City. And how, and I was surprised to see the eBird points showing up, you know, even into like Canada for black vultures. Mm. Um, so I think that the, I think the maps will change as, as they get more and more and as, as more and more people see the birds too. Uh, and it's, it's, uh, it's pretty fascinating to me that they, you know, they're kind of slowly marching, <laughs> marching north. What's also interesting um, about species maps, uh, I'm not, I'm not, a, you know, really, I'm not an expert in how um, mapping species, but uh, Audubon, when John James Audubon, you know, back in 
1827, 1830, when he was putting together, you know, the, all the, the bird, all of his Birds of America, um, his species account for black vulture um, noted that they were in Ohio, in Kentucky all year, um, mm -hmm. in Illinois, Indiana, you know, in Maryland, and now when when black vultures show up in numbers, you know, in some of those places, everybody's like, there are these new birds. Where are they coming from? <laughs> and, you know, they were clearly here 200 years ago, uh, but they had disappeared from that, disappeared from that range, and now they're just kind of getting back to it. That's really interesting. Yeah, it's, it's a... Yeah. <clears throat> um, Katie, I'm going to ask... Uh, I'm going to ask Betsy to go back to <clears throat> the other her slide deck so we can talk about the things that uh, Lily and Michelle, Katie has offered to do other things with Western Cuyahoga Audubon Society. So we kind of wanted to give a little first to that. But do you have any last thought about your book um, that you'd like to share with us or Anything that you'd like to leave us with about the book before we start talking about your <clears throat> conservation center? Um, I don't know. No, I mean, thank you very much for listening to me talk about it. Um, oh, thank, thank you. you. It, it's been really, it's really been fun. And I'm like Michelle. I have always loved vultures. I always liked, as a kid, lying on my back and watching them circle above me. And now I... I'm fortunate enough to live by the Cleveland Zoo, and we have a little, I don't know whether you call it colony of them or flock of them that are, during the summer we have about 10 to 22 at any one time, and now the last week I've only seen like two or three, so I think they're kind of going south, but I really enjoy that. They'll come back in March, know that. So, um, okay, the first thing we want to talk about that, Friday, October 23rd, we're going to have a, a live presentation with Katie at her AVA, Avian Conservation Center of Appalachia. Um, it's going, she's going to show us some of the rehabilitation efforts they have. Uh, she's going to talk about the kinds of things that they need donated. There is a blog post on Western Cuyahoga Audubon Society about what the um, center needs. And as we all know, uh, donations are down for rehabilitation centers and for charitable organizations across the board. But um, it's really a worthwhile center, very, very needed, and these birds are hungry birds and need a lot of, lot of, of food. Uh, and they not only uh, help with raptors and vultures, but they take in all sorts of migratory birds that are injured or um, the things that happen to them on the way. So they, on that blog post, there is a list, a PDF list of uh, Katie's wish uh, wish list. So um, our October fundraiser that we're partnering with the Rehabilitation Center is uh, the Aviation Conservation Center of Appalachia. And it's a very, as you can see, um, Katie is a very earnest uh, advocate of vultures and or other birds that are being rehabilitated there. So uh, moving on, um, Katie is also going to be with us for our uh, book discussion next uh, Sunday. So she's going to spend that hour or a portion of that hour with us, uh, and she's going to tell us some of her favorite nature books or books about birds that she grew up with or she's read recently and and um, Michelle you've uh, participated in that but Lily you haven't done that yet so we ask people to come prepared with a book a book or two that they really feel spoke to them about conservation or nature in some way and just 
uh, have a little prepared three minute to five minute talk about why that book is important to you. So that's the other thing. And uh, Betsy, can we move on to um, the last uh, piece of uh, yes, yeah, this is this is the thing I saved for the uh, best for the last, I think, because I uh, got I have the first the purple uh, book cover for the book that I read because I got it from. Well, it looks blue on there, but it's purple, and I got it from the library, Cleveland Public Library. But the University of Chicago Press, Katie's uh, publisher, is uh, a, they're giving us a discount if we're a friend of Western Cuyahoga Audubon Society or a member. And if you use the code that Betsy's put up there, PR20 Fallon, you get a 20% discount on the book. And um, Michelle, I know that you've already uh, bought the book, and Lily, you may have too, but uh, if you wanted to give it as a gift, it's it's a really uh, a great idea, I think. It's really, I'm going to buy one, so it's going to be one of those legacy books for my grandchildren when I no longer have it on my bookshelf. So it's active till November 9th. So be sure that you let people know to check out Katie's uh, book discussion with us. And um, I'm sure that it will generate some um, interest and uh, might be an interesting um, book for a holiday gift, <laughs> the vulture, the, the private life of an unloved bird, because I, I know that kids just love vultures because of the way they circle and you can see them high in the sky. So anyway, uh, Katie, once again, thank you so much uh, for your time. And um, watch our calendar of events because Katie is going to be sharing more books in March with us, a uh, children's book and uh, her Cerulean Warbler book. So uh, both of those are on our, <laughs> oh, that's great. Uh, both of them are on our uh, schedule for next year. And um, David Lindo, our celebrity birder from the UK and Spain, he's in quarantine in Spain right now, but he is going to be our November author that is going to talk about how uh, his book, How to Be an Urban Birder. And he may be uh, with us on the 22nd of November, and he has the beginnings of uh, Birds on My Mind. It's a book of photographs with of birds and short story, uh, just little short uh, essays about each each bird. Maybe only a page, half a page. So. Uh, we may be hearing about that in November. But again, Katie, I thank you so much. It was so interesting. And I could have listened to you for another hour. I think, I think we all could. But we want to be uh, sure that we don't abuse our time with you. So thanks so much. Well, thank you very much for, for having me. And thank you for, for thank you for listening. I could talk about vultures all day. So. <laughs> <laughs> and we could listen. <laughs> All right. Thanks so much, everybody. Uh, bye, and enjoy the rest of your Sunday. All right. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, good night.